Greetings adventurers and welcome back to Abnormal Voyages. My name is David and today we find ourselves in Oklahoma City at the American Banjo Museum. So strum along as we learn about this unique instrument. Our voyage into the history of banjos begins with a timeline where you get to actually see old banjos all the way up to modern day. The story of the banjo stretches back over 400 years to the 1600s. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly where the banjo was invented, but most sources agree that it came about by enslaved Africans in the Caribbean region. That makes it a uniquely North American instrument. The early to mid-1800s are considered the minstrel era for the banjo. It was played predominantly by slaves in the southern region of the United States. However, others soon picked it up and realized what a fantastic instrument it was, and soon groups were traveling with it in what they called their minstrel acts. The soulful, bluesy, folksy sound of it really resonated with people. Before long, Banjo fever was sweeping across the world, and everybody was falling in love with this new instrument. That leads us directly into the early 1900s, which is considered the classic era for banjo. As the name may suggest, this was a period of time where people decided that the banjo deserved to be up there on the same level as more classical string instruments, such as the violin. It was brought over to Europe, and people were using it in grand symphonies and playing the likes of Mozart and Beethoven with their banjos. This is also the era where the guitar style of playing banjo really took off, and if anything, this period of time did a fantastic job of showcasing just how versatile an instrument the banjo truly was. No matter what genre you were playing in, you could find a place for the banjo. The museum here has a fantastic collection of these banjos stretching way back to the earliest days and just look at how pristine all these instruments still are. They all look like you could just walk in, pick one up, and play whatever song your heart desired. The banjo itself continued to evolve as well. It formerly had four strings, but even today modern banjos typically have five strings. Charging into the 1900s, we had the ragtime era and the jazz era, two periods of time that truly set the banjo world on fire. The world was in a period of great change, and so were musical tastes. Instead of the classical appeal of music before World War I, we had suddenly rushed into a more carefree and happy period, wanting to put the war and things behind them. Musical taste turned to this jazzy kind of music. The banjo proved yet again to be a perfect instrument for this genre. It seems plucking out a carefree, upbeat tune that just makes you want to jump up and dance was a specialty for the banjo. It soon found its way into many songs that are still popular today and was for sure a crowd favorite. Slowly but surely, the banjo was becoming a musical staple. This Gibson banjo was actually given to Les Paul himself by Gibson and was used in several performances by Les Paul, including a world tour through Japan. Gibson, of course, was already one of the number one instrument makers in the world, and Les Paul being such a pioneer in the guitar world, this was a fantastic partnership that historically, we know, would ring true throughout the ages. Something that banjos actually did before electric guitars even came on the scene was getting their flashy, characteristic looks. 
Much like how guitars today can be customized for however the musician wants them to look, during the jazz age, it became really big for banjos to do that exact same thing. It wasn't long before there was gold inlays, designs, anything you can think of were put onto the banjos. The crowds wanted a flashier show and the musicians were determined to give it to them. This created some very unique instruments and it's actually mind-blowing how many of these the museum was able to track down and display here. A lot of these very much transcend being mere instruments and become works of art in my opinion. But it made sense considering how many big names were playing banjos that they would certainly want some unique instruments to go along with it. Earl Scruggs was one such example and he's credited with actually saving the banjo for the most part. After World War II, interest in the banjo had gone down. The jazz era was over. But Earl Scruggs and a few other bluegrass pioneers stepped up to the plate and began using the banjo in a way that's probably more familiar to us nowadays and led us into the modern era of the banjo. It seems this instrument was perfect for bluegrass and country music, not to mention a whole host of folk songs. Even people who didn't listen to those genres soon heard those sounds from Earl Scruggs through the opening theme song of the Beverly Hillbillies. The banjo had found new life, a brand new genre, a brand new audience. It was soon welcomed with open arms in millions of songs. Today, countless performers and artists the world over have picked up that iconic instrument and added a few notes of their own to the banjo story. Here's one of Earl Scruggs actual used banjos. You can see he kind of had that ornateness in there but still didn't take it too overboard. A little humble but still very nice to look at. The museum certainly does a good job of recognizing Earl's place in the history of banjo, even with his autograph on this banjo right here. Tucked away in the corner here, we have a real gem. This is stage attire that was worn by Eddie Peabody, who is commonly known as the King of Banjo. And then right next to it, we have one of his actual banjos on display, and it is gorgeous. Just look at this gold coloring around it all the way up to the neck, definitely worthy of somebody that was called the king. And if that wasn't enough banjo goodness for you, they have an entire second floor. Let's see what's up there. Up here on the second floor, the first thing we find is the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame, where they've inducted all the greats into this humble hall. Interestingly enough, this Hall of Fame was here before the museum, and we have it to thank for the fact that the museum even exists. The hall was first established in 1998 as the National Four-String Banjo Hall of Fame, meant to honor Jazz Age four-string banjo pioneers, as well as contemporary people who carried on that tradition. However, in 2013, the board voted to add in other categories, so soon they were able to honor banjo players of the four and five string variety, as well as people who were non-performers but still really added to the banjo world, such as promoters and things like that. There are still quite a few categories that people can be nominated for to this day, such as historical, four string performance, instruction in education, and five string performances. A really unique treasure here. This is the head of a banjo and the signature up here is Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president himself. He went to a charity organization's big event they were having and he was so impressed by the banjo players playing that he signed his instrument for him. And now it's preserved here for everyone to enjoy. This is a sampling of banjos that come from people who were inducted into the Hall of Fame. So it's really neat to get a chance to see the very instruments that put them in this place of honor. A lot of them were very well decorated and certainly all had a lot of unique character to them. There are plenty of banjos to see here at the museum, but one that really stands out is this one here. 
This is the Gibson bass banjo, custom made, one of a kind. It's huge, as you can see. Stretches all the way back to 1929. Never made another one like it. And the collection of banjos didn't stop downstairs. Here we have an entire wall of banjos. A couple of these are the more modern day ones, but there were plenty of historical ones mixed in there as well. Each one is labeled so you can see who made it, the year it was used, and what materials went into it. I really loved how pristine and just sharp this looked. It was a very, very impressive display, to be sure. But as impressive as this wall was, it wasn't the only unique thing upstairs. One of the places that people could get their banjo music fix was your father's mustache, a very popular chain of nightclubs. They've actually recreated the inside of one right here in the museum. So you know we gotta check it out. This place was super interesting. It kind of gave me the vibes of an old speakeasy mixed with a TGI Fridays and possibly a dash of showbiz pizza thrown in there. Pictures on the wall showed you what your father's mustache looked like in its heyday and honestly it seems like it was a pretty wild place. They had 13 locations in total and employed tons of musicians. Hundreds of banjo players came through these doors and played their hearts out to different crowds every night. It's almost a shame that we don't have places like this anymore. You'd never find a nightclub in this style, especially one that's specifically focused on folk and banjo music. But looking back at these commercials that were playing, it just seemed like it was a whole lot of fun. There's kind of a nostalgic feeling for something that I never even experienced. If anyone watching this has ever been to one of the Your Father's Mustaches, definitely let us know what it was like. Now, we've covered that a lot of these banjos are gorgeous and really made into works of art, but one in particular I wanted to show you is this one here created by Dale Small. This is the Carousel Banjo, and it is exquisite exquisitely gorgeous. Just the way that there's an entire carousel around it, the back with all the colors and the horses, I have truly never seen an instrument as beautiful as this. This banjo next to me has a very unique history. In 1998, the Kennedy Center created the Mark Twain Prize. It was used to recognize Americans who made an impact on American culture similar to the way Mark Twain did. This was given to Steve Martin, and as you can see, is a beautiful banjo. He received this award in 2005. It's very unique, one of a kind, very special. Now, Steve Martin visited the Banjo Museum that we are in right now and liked it so much that he knew this is where this one of a kind banjo needed to live so that it could be seen and loved by everyone. Well, that's all the time we have for today, adventurers. My name is David. This has been Abnormal Voyages. Thanks for strumming along. We'll see you in the next one.